Up until now, uh, whenever we've spoken of mechanical equilibrium, we've suggested that the net force on any object is equal to zero if that object's in equilibrium. That's just one of two conditions for equilibrium. This is the condition for translational equilibrium. There's a second condition for equilibrium. Uh, oh, and let's keep in mind, this is a vector sum of external force. In the same regard, when the vector sum of external torques on a system is equal to zero, that represents rotational equilibrium. So for an object to be in a complete state of equilibrium, it has to satisfy both of those conditions. So we'll say this is condition one for equilibrium, and the other statement is condition two for equilibrium. Some people will divide condition one into a 1a and a 1b. They'll say condition 1a, the sum of all forces along the x-axis has to equal zero, and condition b, the sum of all forces on the y-axis is equal to zero. Um, in any case, let me give you some examples of an object that could be in one type of equilibrium but not the other. So you can try this actually with a textbook or your calculator or your phone. Find anything that's nearly square or rectangular. And if it's something with a uniform distribution of mass, then its center of mass will be at its geometric center. And try with your left hand and your right hand pushing. So two forces align with each other and align through the center of mass of the object. And the two forces are equal in magnitude. So you have a force pushing to the right and a force just as big pushing to the left. And of course, in this case, the sum of all force would be equal to zero. And not only that, because the forces align with the axis of rotation, then there's no net torque either. So this is an example of an object that's in complete equilibrium. Now, what if you took those same two forces applied to the same object, but you changed the location? So the center of mass is still shown at the geometric center, and the two forces still oppose each other equal magnitudes in opposite directions. So again, we have a situation where the net force is, is equal to zero, and so you say the object is in a state of translational equilibrium. However, there's a net torque. So if we extend the line of force and find a distance perpendicular to that line of force, there's some R perpendicular, which represents a lever arm. And so we've got a force and a lever arm. There's a torque, and this torque would tend to make this rotate in a uh, clockwise direction in the very same way that the other force has an associated torque. There's a lever arm perpendicular to the line of action of force. And so both torques would tend to rotate the block in a clockwise direction. And so there is a non-zero net amount of torque, so it is not in rotational equilibrium. And so the end effect of this is this block would rotate clockwise, and so a moment later it might be in this position, and a moment after that it might be in this position, but the center of mass isn't changing location. So that's why we say it's in translational equilibrium. There's no translation of the center of mass of the object. There's only a rotation. So the acceleration of the center of mass is equal to zero, but the angular acceleration of the system is not equal to zero. Let's do some more examples. What if you had two forces, and they're not equal in magnitude? F1 pushing to the right is greater than F2 pushing to the left. Is there any sort of equilibrium here? Okay, so the net force is definitely not zero, and so there is some acceleration of the center of mass. And so this object is going to translate through space, right? The object is going to move, not just with some velocity, but with some acceleration to the left. 
but the net torque, as you can see, would be equal to zero in this case, and so there'd be no rotation for this object. So this is an example of uh, rotational equilibrium, but not translational equilibrium. And so then we've got another case. The object is pushed with two different forces of unequal magnitudes. So in the same way, we'll say F1 is greater than F2. So now not only is there a net force, there's also some net amount of torque. And I guess this object would not only... Oh, ridiculous. Sorry about that previous example. Just caught myself. F1 was the larger of the two forces, wasn't it? I don't know why I drew it accelerating to the left. No, this object would definitely be accelerating to the right. And in our final case, this object is going to accelerate to the right. And it's also going to have an angular acceleration in the clockwise direction. So this object is going to rotate as it translates through space. Okay, so those are the conditions for equilibrium. Uh, the point of this unit, 4.3, on equilibrium and elasticity, is to try to highlight some examples of how we can apply cases in which the net torque and the net force are both equal to zero. And then in the second half of this unit, we'll get into elasticity, and we'll learn about quantities known as bulk modulus, Young's modulus, and shear modulus. So stay tuned.